This interview might be subtitled, A Star is Born. Uh, I, uh, I was chosen, I guess, to do this interview because of my advanced age and I guess my air of dignity, which you all know I don't really have. Uh, and anyway, but uh, in, in reading about Ananya, my first reaction was, is this person for real? And indeed, she's better than for real because when I watched her YouTube videos, I've never seen anyone who communicates better with less jargon, makes things clearer, explains the most arcane technical issues and language that everybody can understand. So anyway, you're uh, a pioneer also in the art of in our art and the art of communications. Um, Ananya, I wanted to, I know you have an unusual background, um, born in Madagascar, grew up in, um, in Toronto. Um, when did you, you know, you've had, hard, hardly had a typical high school experience. And can you go into when you realized at whatever, 14, that your mission really was maybe not being in the drama society or being a cheerleader or being on the, the soccer team, it was pursuing big ideas. You had a real mission in life. Right. Um, it definitely started very early. I, I guess I, I've always had like a naive arrogance to think that like I can do anything. Um, and in almost believing that, it's definitely come true. When I was 14, I joined this program called the Knowledge Society, which is like a human accelerator, and it totally changed my life. I got exposed to a whole bunch of different experimental technologies, tools. I realized that conferences are a thing. Uh, I just began to realize that young people have so much like, potential and power, and if, if, we, if we believe we can do anything, we legitimately actually can. Right, and one of the early coups that you had was winning, I love this, this name, the, the Crypto Chicks uh, Hackathon, yeah. which involved applying genomics to the blockchain. Right, right yeah, so I had started off doing gene editing research. I spent two years in a gene editing lab um, working on the team that cured muscular dystrophy in mouse models, um, and now they're in clinical trials. But while I was there, I noticed that genetic data is so important. Everything relies on data. You have to know where to make your cuts, how to program your CRISPR-Cas, and I realized that there isn't a lot of good data, so I wanted to learn more about blockchain, went to a lot of meetups in Toronto, built a platform to allow people to anonymously upload genetic information to research data sets, and even though it was anonymous, they could still get paid for their contributions. Ended up winning the hackathon, ended up working on it a bit more. It got moved into consensus, where I worked a bit after. Um, and yeah, that was definitely a moment where I was like, Weird, this world is crazy. I'm so lucky I can do anything. Yeah. Right, so does that have implications for the pharmaceutical industry, for new drug development? W what are the implications? Right. I guess it really showed me that blockchain is so powerful for things that most people like, forget about. And I think one of the biggest use cases of blockchain will definitely be for things that couldn't have existed before, but now we can use by using the properties of blockchain in the back end. For example, um, like, People think that in our near future, it's very likely that we're going to spend a lot of our time in virtual reality. And it might seem far-fetched, but if you have really good VR, like with really nice haptic feedback, you get to live in a world where you don't have to pay expensive costs for housing. You don't have to pay expensive costs for education because you can, like one Harvard prof can teach a bajillion people. You don't have to pay for transportation. So if we spend our time living in virtual worlds, for example, um, and we like spend all our real money buying a virtual world house, and the game maker tomorrow just deletes your house, that would suck. But with something like blockchain where you can establish trust, now everyone knows that you have your house over there. And I'm getting excited, but if, like even in the real world, if we have things like digital identity, for example, if you're a refugee and you lose your papers, you don't exist. If someone else has control of your passport, of your ID, and they go into a bank, they create a bank account, they are you. And there are so many ways where blockchain can also add value in terms of if I want to establish that I am myself, maybe with like biometrics, for example, it tracks my brain waves when I do a certain action, my ECG signals, my fingerprint, a combination of different things could allow the blockchain to know that I am me, I own these stocks and I own this house and I have this passport and everyone knows that this is me or like <laughs> there are so many, but um, like using it for data attribution. So like there's a cup, the Access Copyright, which is the leading copyright organization in Canada, is looking into how we can attribute paintings and books to their rightful owners. So when they're used or when data is used, the rightful owner gets paid. And I guess overall, um, blockchain adds value in a lot of really interesting places. And if, so if I were to give you a $100 bill and I'm like, take this $100 bill, you'd be like, yeah, I'll take it. And then you would take it because it gave you value. 
And if something can give you value, and if you can create it, so if it's possible to cre create value, if it exists and it creates value, people will use it. And I'm almost entirely certain that blockchain adds value, and it's possible, so people will definitely use it. Right, so your view also is the, is a trust deficit in blockchain, right? And that's the real issue, not the technology. I know that you created two cryptocurrencies. You went through a lot of steps. By the way, if you get to see this on YouTube, the whole experience that Ananya went through creating, what was it, Peach and Profit, these two cryptocurrencies, it's one of the best educations I've ever read about the mechanics of creating a cryptocurrency and the barriers involved. But you feel it's not the technology, it's the trust. So and you also say that the technology is going to advance much faster than people expect. We've already seen Libra, right? Is that an inflection point? Where do we go from here? I think Libra is really cool. Before, people used to have Bitcoin, and you would speculate on it. You would try and make 500% by buying Bitcoin. And now you have something like Libra where it's, you actually know the value of it. So it's not going to be used for, I want to make 500% off of crypto. Rather, you're going to use it for a lot of where, where blockchain, where crypto makes sense. So, Another thing I think is really important is the team behind Libra is crazy. Uh, and if you look at the teams behind Ethereum, they definitely didn't have as much scale or network or reach as the people who are creating Libra. So it's definitely a completely new thing in terms of trust, ability to get it to a whole bunch of people. I think it's definitely, it, it's, it will be a lot more well accepted and play a big role. I know that since it makes a lot of sense, since it'll be trusted, it's definitely going to happen. It, well, maybe it won't be implemented because of regulation, but I know that in the future, we're going to see crazy things. I guess what I'm saying is people were freaking out when Bitcoin came out, but then they kind of subdued themselves. They're like, oh, we don't really have to worry about it. Then Ethereum came out, and you're like, OK, maybe we have to start thinking about regulation because there's two things. Then um, Libra comes out after a slump, and everyone's like, oh my god, we have to start like, worrying like crazy, like creating regulations. This is going to take over the world. But we need to think about what's next. Not about what's already been created. When I, I was in like the discussion room this morning and everyone was talking about regulation for what exists right now. That's wrong. You have to think about regulation for what will come in the next like two years or three years or it's already too late. Facebook reached a billion users in like the shortest amount of time. Things grow exponentially. And because things grow so fast and it's so hard to conceive of it, it's super important that we try and predict where the technology will go. And we try and adapt our systems for where we think it will be rather than for where it is right now. Right. So you think the technology will just, the speed of technological change will, will overwhelm any ability to regulate it or not? Or do you think the regulators can block or, or slow the progress in, in Bitcoin usage or cryptocurrency usage? If you graph most technology things, like the cost of sequencing a genome or the number of people who have access to the internet or the improvement in brain-computer interface technology or machine learning capabilities, it's all been on an exponential curve. And humans think linearly. We are programmed to think linearly, so we can't even conceive of what exponential means. And because of that, I think it's super important to recognize that it moves fast, incentives are misaligned, the US government isn't incentivized to recognize another currency that's competing with the US dollar. Um, and, but consumers are like, they just take whatever brings value. And because things are misaligned, it's super important that we're cognizant about that in order to move forward. Right. You're also dealing a lot with uh, brain-computer interfaces. Um, you are able to control cars with brain waves, with toy cars. You're able to um, control prosthetics. Just briefly, what's, what, what, what does the future hold there? It's crazy. Ray Kurzweil, who used to be the head of engineering at Google, thinks that we might solve brain chips by the 2030s. And if you look at the research studies that have been done in mouse models, they've been able to get a blind mouse through a maze with a brain chip by like giving it, like downloading a virtual map or GPS almost. Or they were able to have brain to brain, primitive brain to brain communication in mice. And also in humans, they played a game with like two. The technology is absolutely insane for brain computer interfaces, and it will totally change the way we live. Brain to brain communication. Maybe instead of me talking to you guys today, you would just already know. Or brain to internet communication. It could be like me talking to Siri, or it could be like something we can't even conceive of. There are so many tools that will totally change humanity. Brain computer interfaces, genetics, blockchain, nanotech, um, virtual reality, nuclear fusion, alternative energy, quantum computing. And I think it's so important that we're all at least aware of the different tools that we have available to us to solve problems, and also, the questions that we need to ask when technology grows exponentially.
Because there are so many questions. Like, what if your brain could be hacked? Or do we want to spend our entire life in VR? Some people will be like, yeah, that's, I'd have a blast. Some people will be like, I value real life. I, I guess my, my last thought before we leave is I challenge you all today for like the next five days to try and learn something new about a new industry that you never would have thought to look into. Because I think the only way we're going to have the best possible future for humanity when dealing with blockchain, when dealing with finance, and when dealing with all the other tools that will change our systems and our um, civilization for the future is if we're all aware, or at least you guys are all aware of the different things that will play a role. So definitely Google those things. I think it'll be super important. Thank you. I'm not going to open it up for questions. I selfishly took all this time to ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ananya. Yeah.